Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Vale, Executive Director of Genelia Research Campus, and I'd like to welcome my colleagues here at Genelia and uh, my friends at HHMI headquarters, and also a special warm welcome to a group of K through 12 educators oh. from our uh, local community of Loudoun County. So warm welcome to you, oh. too. Um, So we are in for a very, very special treat this evening, and we're all going to have a chance to hear from someone who is truly inspirational, uh, Dr. Freeman Robowski. So just four days ago, uh, I watched uh, Dr. Robowski receive the 2023 Public Welfare Medal from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, which is their highest honor and bestowed on an individual for their extraordinary use of science for the public good. And Freeman received this medal for his outstanding leadership in transforming US science education and increasing cultural diversity within the scientific workforce. And after this hour unfolds, I think it will be abundantly clear to this audience why uh, Freeman won this award and also so many others that I can't name, including an amazing 45 honorary degrees. So Freeman um, is Freeman actually 50 some now, now, right? Oh yeah, man! It's like someone's got to update that wiki Wikipedia page. That's so funny. Uh, I'm sorry. It's too fast, you know, to like keep up with that, Freeman. Anyway, Freeman asked if we can structure this event uh, as a conversation or a dialogue. Yes. yes. Which seems uh, in keeping with an event that is called uh, dialogues. Yes, great. So I'll keep my introductory remarks uh, brief yeah. because you're going to hear more about Freeman's history and work uh, through his own voice uh, during the interview. But just as a preface, um, Freeman served a remarkable three decades as president of University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He just stepped down from that role last year. But during what I would call his epic of uh, service at UMBC, he transformed uh, UMBC from a commuter college to a residential university with high national rankings uh, in, in many categories, including being the top US producer of black undergraduates who uh, go on to receive PhDs in the sciences and engineering. And the path to this last achievement involved uh, Freeman's founding of the pioneering uh, Meyerhoff program, which you will uh, hear about shortly. Freeman's also been a, an inspiration to HHMI and Genelia. So HHMI um, has been a proud uh, supporter of the Meyerhoff Scholars Program and also helped to spread this program to other universities. At Genelia, uh, two years ago, we launched the Genelia Meyerhoff Scholars Program. And at the end of this month, we are welcoming 11 Meyerhoff undergrads from UMBC and other um, universities to come to Genelia and have a summer research experience. And HHMI uh, Science under uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron O'Shea and Leslie Vossel's leadership uh, launched a major new HHMI initiative to support early career researchers at the assistant professor stage who have a strong potential to become leaders in, this in their fields and also uh, advance diversity, equity, and inclusion through their mentorship and understanding uh, the experiences of trainees from races and ethnicities underrepresented in US science. And recognizing uh, Freeman's foundational work in this area, HHMI named uh, this new program, the Freeman Horbowski Scholars Program. And the first cohort of these scholars, excitingly, is gathering next week at HHMI headquarters. Yeah. <laughs> and Freeman is going to give them some, I am sure, incredible inspirational uh, talk to this group. So Freeman uh, is a hero to many of us in this room, myself included. And what amazes, uh, there's so many things that amaze me about Freeman. But um, one thing to share with you is uh, how Freeman is able to both think at a big strategic level, at an institutional and national level, but also how he devotes time and attention and cares deeply about individuals. And I've heard so many amazing stories about how Freeman, even as a, a busy president of a large university, has taken time to mentor students one-on-one, -on -one, 
not only while they were at UMBC as undergraduates, but after they graduated and throughout their career. In short, people matter to Freeman, and his life's work perhaps can be framed uh, around bringing out the best in people, something that he has uh, done personally, but also inspired the rest of us to do the same. Uh, so Freeman, it is such an honor um, for you to come to Genelia, and, uh, and this is an organization where we also believe in bringing out the best in people from all backgrounds and from all parts of our organization, because we believe that lies at the heart of our success too. So let's give Freeman uh, a big round of welcome to Genelia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The, the more honorary degrees simply means that the older the person is. <laughs> Just like the longer the introduction is. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Yeah, so also I just want to tell the audience that you have these two books, and I really encourage you uh, to read them because they are incredible. And also after you finish one, you can shift and change and read the other one with one of your colleagues. But um, I'll also use this, these books to kind of frame three okay. themes for the conversation. Uh -huh. um, first, starting off with, uh, Freeman, your personal journey. Yeah. Uh, growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, and also your educational experiences, because I think that really framed how sure. you thought about education later. Sure. And then we'll talk about your time at UMBC mm -hmm. and the Meyerhoff program, and mm -hmm. also how you kind of galvanized all of your colleagues to create a culture of uh, inclusive excellence at the university. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we'll zoom out to the big picture yeah. of uh, you know the nation, because uh, you've uh, said we, we're a nation at a crossroads, mm -hmm. um, uh, both in education and also thinking about diversity yes. in, in, in um, our scientific workforce. So yes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on where we've been and where we are now and where we're going. Okay. So. Um, um, well, let's dig into it. Okay. So I, I, I told Freeman that we're, we're in walking the hall, we're, we're going to start with um, your, your grandmother's. Good. Because um, yeah. it almost seems like you're, you almost have a destiny to higher education that was set in motion, even from the experience of your grandmothers yeah. who lived in different parts of Alabama. Yeah. Um, I don't think they knew each other growing yeah. up, but they no. seem to have shared a very influential experience. Yes. yes that also shaped how they raised their children, which mm -hmm. were your parents, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the tradition carried on. So maybe you sure. could tell me a little bit about your, your grandmothers sure, and, right. and that experience sure. that they had. Let me start by, by saying how honored I am to be here. Uh, I've said to Aaron before, <clears throat> I could never have imagined the, the honor that HHMI has given me. And as I said, on Sunday at the National Academy of Sciences, I don't know anyone in the philanthropic community doing, quite frankly, as much as HHMI. And so I want you to give the leadership, Janelia and HHMI, Leslie and Aaron, a round of applause for that. I really mean that, I really do. And so I, and I, I intend to be an ambassador as I go around talking about it. Because right now, whenever I go to a university, everybody wants to tell me either we've had somebody nominated for the Rabowski Scholars or they've gotten one, and they think somehow I have something to do with giving out the money. And I love saying I don't have a damn thing to do with the money part. I, they just have my name to them, but I don't have it. I make that very clear. I say talk to Leslie. <laughs> with that said, uh, my grandmothers were daughters of slaves. Their parents had been born in slavery. That's how quickly we go back to slavery, if you think about it. My, both of my grandmothers were born in the late 1880s and uh, 1890. And um, they first began thinking about education in the first decade of the 20th century when they saw the leading educator in black in America come to their towns, to Wetumpka, Alabama, outside of Montgomery, and Selma. And his name was Mr. Booker T. Washington. And when Mr. Washington came, you may not have thought about this, he came on horse, you see. Uh, I have a picture of him on a horse. And what he said, and these two women at that time, what he said was, send your children to school. Send your children to school. And those women, um, and then their husbands, but those women 
remembered that. And that is the beginning of our thinking in my family, several generations about school. And literally, um, that led to both of my parents going and becoming teachers. And that was the beginning. The other story, though, and I talk about it a lot uh, as we think about voting, my grandmother, Gracie, literally uh, led the fight to have blacks able to vote in Elmo County, outside of Montgomery, in 1961, when uh, white men could even put an X and vote, because most whites, quite frankly, in that part, couldn't read either. Grandmother had gone to the sixth grade, loved to read, but the, it was something called the Alabama Literacy Test. When you get a chance to look at that test, I gave it to lawyers at the Department of Justice, and most of them couldn't pass it. it was very, so I told them they could no longer vote, all right? <laughs> but the key is this. Uh, she took the test the first time with some of her friends, and women had gone in, and it was clear they didn't know the answers. It was from the Constitution. She was so smart. She came The next time she gave them assignments, you learn these. It was the same test every time. She gave them assignments of the questions to learn. All right? They came out. She had them write them all down. They put the test together. They got to my mother, who was an English teacher, and my mother began grilling them. And, and I, I would be asking the questions, and my grandmother sounded like an attorney. The third time she went in, she passed with fine and fine colors. She walked into my house, and she said, I am now a voting citizen of this country. She was 70 years old. Give her a round of applause. Wow. Yeah. Well, your your uh, parents and also your mother also sounded like yeah. amazing individuals. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said in one of your books that my teachers, including my mom. Yeah. So you thought of your mom as one of your teachers oh, who, yeah. uh, who were demanding of me were particularly inspirational. Mm. It's true. It's really true. And I grew up in, in Birmingham, we, and this was with teachers, kids, and everything. So some of you are old enough to remember a name like Angela Davis. You know, uh, Angela's mother taught me, and my mom was taught her, but... But my mother was my toughest teacher. I got my worst grades. I got B's in my mother's class. And the reason I got B's was that I could memorize things fast. And you know, if you, if you, if, where, where are the K-12 people in the room? Where, someone, let me tell you this. You know, if you, if you can memorize the way a problem is solved and you do just like the teacher, they think you're brilliant. They don't even realize they did it that way. They said, this is really good, right? But what my mother knew was, yeah, I could memorize it like that, but then I'd forget it after I had the test. And she would, some, I would call it tricking me, and she would just give the same test the next day. And I wouldn't know it. <laughs> and it was her way of telling everybody, don't, don't be fooled by his memory. He's not thinking deeply about the problem. You know, sometimes in this country, we think speed necessarily means grasping the concept. It doesn't. Sometimes when it takes someone more time to get it, they really have it and they keep it, right? And it was her way of teaching me to not try to dazzle with memory, but to take time to really think deeply about it. That was the lesson. And she had gone from being an English teacher to a math teacher during the new math time. So she was a math specialist, and, and I was her guinea pig. So all my life I was doing word problems. Best thing that could have happened. Yeah. I loved where your mom also said, you have, to be, you have to be twice as good, but if you get the knowledge, you can shape your future. Mm -hmm. Remember that you're not in this for yourself, mm -hmm. but to change things for everyone. So when my mother and father sent me to Massachusetts, in the early 60s, I was, I was, I'd was I skipped grade, so I was, I was actually going to the 11th grade, but I was actually 13. I was a nerdy little fat kid loving pie, loving to eat, all right? And in the South, we love those fat cheeks. You all know what I'm talking about. And, um, but uh, it was the first time I was to be in class with white kids, and um, what was amazing in Springfield, Massachusetts, in, in chemistry, math, and one literature course. And what shocked me, though, was that nobody would speak to me. Nobody would talk. One or two people would smile, but they wouldn't talk. And I was a very, very jovial kid. And even when I'd raise my hand, teachers would not, would not call me. They were not mean. They just, they ignored me. They were not accustomed to a black. I called home, and I said to my parents, they don't like me here. And she said, are there any other blacks in the class? No. Do you know anybody else from Alabama who's there? Uh, is the education good? I said, it's really good. It's hard. I love it. It's really hard. And uh, she said, then I'm going to tell you something that, that may shock you. So just get ready for this. And she said, son, I want you to suck it up. <laughs> uh, she said, the world is not fair. And um, you just have to get the education. Get the education. Do your best. The world will always have some people who may not like you. We did not send you there to be liked. We sent you there to get the education. Okay? It'll be okay. All right? 
I learned later, she got off the phone and cried like a baby, that they were doing me like that. But she had to toughen me up. You get the point? She had to, and to teach me, you don't have time to be a victim. Just get to work. Get to work. That system has brought me back there since then. And they did, and, and we've had wonderful conversations. And they, and they said it is true that people were uncomfortable, and that did happen. And they did apologize, but it was a reality. And it's something I say to my students, though, when they think somebody's not being as nice or when people are tough. The two things I say is if somebody's tough on you in a lab or something, appreciate it. Get the tough skin. The best mentors and champions and advisors are going to give you honesty. If you need to think more critically, if you're not being as serious, if you don't write well, if you're not working with, if somebody tells you that, thank them. Because the best learning occurs, quite frankly, often when you hear something you don't want to hear, but you need to rethink it, right? So it was a great lesson. And then you don't want to be defined by whether somebody likes you or not. No, get the knowledge. That was the point. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, not fair, yeah. let's, let's go back to Birmingham, Alabama. Uh. And um, you all know that comedian who was on the journalist, the White House, was also from Birmingham, Alabama, the Roy Jones guy, right? And our society is such that he is so much more prestigious than I am, even though I, I'm working on math and science, but Alabama was proud of their comedian. You get my point. And that's not to be disparaging, but it is to say something about values. We should be wanting our children to be scientists more so than comedians. Give me a round of applause for that. That's the point. <laughs> Nothing wrong with comedians, but you get my point. Right? Yeah, we do need some comedians. We too, need in some this laughter. World. Yeah, I make people laugh too. Go ahead. You do. You do. <laughs> that big smile. Uh, I think um, laughter is very important. It is important. Yes. Um, but anyway, let's go back to uh, Birmingham, and you know, you were in a uh, which was uh, a town in a time yeah. that was not fair, yeah. and you were in a in a church and. Yeah. You heard a man uh, say a message to you while you were sitting yeah. there that tomorrow can be better than it's today. And everyone, including children, could bring about positive change in the world. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, I'm sitting in the back of the church, not wanting to be there. What kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week? And my parents made me go, and they were placating me with the two things I love most. Math, my little algebra, I'm 12. Uh, and I'm about to go to the 10th grade, and I'm doing this algebra, loving my word problems. And I'm eating M&M's, the good kind with the peanuts. You know the kind, <laughs> right? And, but I am trying to listen. And at one point, this guy says, um, he says what he just said, what Ron said. And then he said, and, and our children can go to better schools. Now, we had some great teachers, black, all black schools, but they had no resources. And the schools were not, the buildings were nothing like the white school. And we had to use hand-me-down books, which was so insulting. And at that time, you couldn't even bring, even if my parents wanted to buy a book, you don't bring new books in if everybody else is using used books. You see? So you know you've got the books that the school system has given you because you're black after white children finish with them. Not a good feeling. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and when they said, we can go to the other schools, I said, who is that guy? And of course, his name was Dr. Martin King. And uh, I went home and told my parents, I've got to go. I've got to march. And what did my parents tell me? Absolutely not. They said, you're 12. <laughs> if you march, you're going to jail, right? And being the rebellious kid I was, and I was very rebellious, I said, you kids, you, you all are hypocrites. At that time, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. <laughs> they said, go to your, I said, you, you made me go. I listened. Now I want to do what the man says, and you tell me I can't go. You're hypocrites. And they said, go to your room. I knew I was in trouble. The next day they come in, they did not sleep. They talked about it all night long. And they came and they said, it wasn't that we don't trust you. We don't trust the people who will be over you. Because if you march, you're going to jail. And we just worry about, you're, you're 12. You know? And I said, but I can think. And this is what I want to do. And I told my mom, and you, you protested and got fired. You see, my mother was known for having protested for the teachers in the room. She, pro she led the protest for the equalization of teacher salaries in 1948. And um, they fired one person, my mother, because she was such a big mouth and so confident she'd get all the teachers to follow her. If they could get rid of her, 
they could calm people, and that's exactly what they did, right? Fortunately, she was so good, the bigger system, Birmingham, hired her, right? But I tell you that because I say, well, you protest. And she said, yeah, I was grown. You're not grown, right? But, but they thought about it, and they allowed me to do it. I did march. It was a, a horrific experience, and yet, um, without going into details, it taught me, it empowered me. It empowered the children to know that even children can have an impact on their own future. And in jail, being treated like a slave, like an animal, with too many children on the floor, not enough bathrooms, kids as young as eight, crying, and the smell is awful. We look out the window, and there is Dr. King, and there are our parents, and he's saying, what you do this day will change America. And it was shortly after that that several things happened, but we had legislation of all kinds in 64 and 65 that did change America and for higher education, for civil rights, for voting rights and all those things. So it taught me that even young children can be empowered to think about their future and to know what we learned was we may be treated like animals or criminals, but we are not here. We are here because we want a better world, better life. That was, that was the point. And as my principal said, when we got out and were put out of school, he used Thoreau and civil disobedience, that we had the right as Americans to say when we thought a law was unjust, and we thought it was unjust, that we'd be given a poor, a less, a, a less than education, you know? And, so, and at the time, people still thought it was wrong to use the children, and yet now I think they realize they had no choice to get the attention of America. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe you could say something about your own courage, because you also said... Uh, Give me a math problem to face, and I'm fine. Face fire hoses and dogs. Oh God! Really? Oh, I was so scared. Yeah. If there is a in the in the in the book in this book, you will find if you turn, uh, it's so. Far, Birmingham News found a picture of me marching. I'm at the back. Uh, I'm next to the last person on the, in the back, and everybody says oh, I look mean. I wasn't mean. I was scared. <laughs> Let me tell you, my students said, you must have been really courageous. There was nothing courageous about me. The only thing I'd ever attacked in my life was a math problem. Do you hear me? In other words, when a fight broke out, I was running the other way. All right? All I ever fought was a math problem. But, but the fact is that uh, it, it was very scary. It was the dogs and the fires, but it was being in jail. It's an awful feeling. If you, how many of you have been in jail? <laughs> Did you hear what I'm saying? One, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love your pride in saying, yeah. yes, I've been there. I'm with you. I love it. <laughs> but the fact, it's a horrible feeling. I mean, I know why the cage bird sings. I mean, Tony, Tony Martin, it's just an awful feeling. You feel, you feel hopeless. You do. And for children to be treated that way was just awful. And before that, you know, 600 marchers there, yeah. Bull, Bull Connor uh, he did. chose he did. you. Yeah, I was. I, you see that line where at a certain point, the kids who were over 14... 14 and older went one to one facility. Those who were under 14 went the other way. So I ended up leading because I was, I was 12, but I was going to the 10th grade. So I was more mature than the other kids. And so I was the spokesman. And I get up to City Hall. And why were we put in jail? Because they would not give us a, pro, a, 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 a what do you call it, um, a, a permit to protest peacefully. All we wanted to do, so simple, was to get to the, the, the steps of City Hall and as the police commissioner asked me, what do you want, little nigra? That was the term, nigra. What do you want? I said, sir. And I said, sir, because in the South, you say sir rather than sir. We want to kneel and pray for our freedom to get a better education. That was it. That was all we asked for, to kneel and pray for a better education. And he was so angry that when the TV camera was turned the other way, and he spat in my face. And then he threw me into the police wagon. He did. He really did. Uh, he was angry because the rest of the country was looking at a city putting its children in jail. And the only reason it got, it looked so with turmoil was they did put dogs on kids. And I did not get a part of that. And they took fire hoses and just knocked kids out and down with it. It was awful. It really was. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but I, I have to say this. When he died, this is very important, a lesson. When he died, my mother called and she said, Bull Connor died. And I said, Mother, why are you crying? He was awful to me. I was in college then. And she said something. 
you know, your mother can get to you. I mean, I wasn't happy, but I wasn't going to cry for this man. He was awful to me. And she said, Freeman, she said, I cried because he was somebody's child. And I'm so sorry that his family, his mother didn't teach him to care about other people different from himself. He was taught that hatred from a baby. She said, I, I, I pray for him and his soul. You know, and by the time she finished talking, I'm crying. <laughs> and, and it was so cathartic for me to get over whatever I was feeling and to realize what a shame that a man lived his life hating little black children. What a shame, right? And, but I needed not to hate him. You can hate this is what my parents, you can hate what somebody does, but you don't hate the person because it eats on the inside. And that helped me so much because I was holding all that in. I was just remembering that ugly experience, but then I had to just rise above it and say, no, what a shame that he, he didn't help my mother to tell him to learn to love people regardless of background. You know, that, that was the message. That's, that's the lesson, not the other stuff. It is that we learn to be better. That's the lesson we take from this. Not the negativity, no, that we want to be better. When my students say today, oh, things have never been this divided, I say, no, go back to the 60s, the 1860s, or the 1960s. When we say, oh, Congress has never, listen, everybody's seen Hamilton. I mean, think about it. our forebears were beating each other with canes in Congress, right? Or you think about, you think about the people who killed each other. Of Adams being, I mean, Aaron Burr and Hamilton and uh, a duel and uh, that leaders of our country shooting each other, right? So what I'm saying is we've had periods that have been as bad as now. So that we need to know our history to know we get, big, we get better than this. We go through legislation, we vote, we make decisions, and it makes us better. Yeah. I'll just touch upon the yes. subject of finding joy. Yeah. Uh, you found uh, joy in math. Yes. And you know, one of the things I also encourage you to uh, look at is Freeman's iBiology talk, which oh. is a project that I ran. And um, Freeman gave a talk about a decade ago. But uh, I remember that talk because, like, at the beginning, you super gleefully say, I get goosebumps doing math. Yeah. And, you know, how many, <laughs> how many people say that? <laughs> it's true. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so how did, you, uh, how did you connect with My math? family, my mom and dad love math, too. And we really, they were working to help more families send their kids to college. My dad, who had left teaching to work in a steel mill because he could make much more money and do the reading and writing and math for his white supervisor, who had not finished high school. But um, dad would work with the, the men of color, helping them get ready to go to the GED classes at night that my mother ran in math and English. And it was always the math people were afraid of. So that I watched them help people realize, you can stop thinking you can't do math. You can do math. Just keep an open mind. We can do this. And I learned that from them. They loved, so we were doing worry problems all the time. I mean, I would get goosebumps doing math problems. I still do. And I, I really, I did, I did math problems with some postdocs today. And, and here's the math problem for all of you, okay? Don't holler out an answer. If you do, you owe me $100. Do not holler out an answer. <laughs> it's a sixth grade math problem, and even PhDs have to think about it. Um, 29 children are in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? I'll say it again. 29 children are in a class. 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? Your first answer is probably wrong, even if you're a PhD. You got to okay. think about it. And I want you, we're not going to discuss it today. The nice thing is I'm not giving you the answer because what I see in other countries with international math is they want people just to think about it, dream about it, fight about it. It's the process more than the answer that counts. It's the thinking that matters. Okay. All right. We got something to uh, talk about yeah. at the reception there. And if you get um, some wine, drink some wine and talk about it. Yeah, you know? drink some wine. I want to hear kids. I want to hear Americans fighting about math, right? <laughs> but I, for me, I tell students, I love working with fourth and fifth grade children. And getting, they go, he's crazy. He loves math. Yeah, I get goosebumps. I said, well, feel it. I'm getting goosebumps, baby. And I really do. But I mean, I, mean, I, look, at, I look, at the, look at the patterns above us. These circles, you know, look at this room. Why is it, when you think about the mathematics, of the, why is it that there's a feeling of intimacy here, of warmth here? It's to use the best of design. I was at a medical school, and I was telling them it was so, um, it was so cold 
It was the, the, the it was just regimented, rigid. This is flowing. It it encourages. Might have see the last line, last person, and there's an intimacy that we have. For me, this is all math. It really is. So that's that's the point. Everywhere you look, the leaves, the patterns, right? Nature. It's math, folks. I don't want you to ever think about math again to say everything we see is math. Your shapes of your heads, right? Patterns. All right. Okay. Well, that's a, a great lead into my next question. Because if you're out there in the reception area having a glass of wine, talking and solving that math problem, yeah. what are you doing? You're collaborating, that's you're right. talking yeah, to other right. people, you're yes. problem solving together. Yes. yes. And, um, you know, I think that uh, that's so important. And um, I, I think you've had some experiences, you know, early in your education, and you brought that into the Meyerhoff program and what you did at UMBC. Like, I think you, you know, you really have this deep belief in the power of collaboration. And my TED Talk talks about these four pillars, and people either love my TED Talk or they hate it. Uh, most people love it because they, they had the experience. We, we still call it first and second year of science in American engineering weed out courses. Most people get weeded out. And when I chaired the National Academies Committee, the data showed that. And people say, oh, they leave it because of money. No, it's because people get a C in chemistry or D. And they never tell it about it. They, but you, in the human and people in the human, this is a this is a, a stereotypical statement, but it's true. People in the humanities, arts, and social sciences tend to be warmer. I mean, you don't find a lot of scientists like Aaron, who <laughs> or Ron, who are just nice and warm. My wife said he's a nice man, Karen. My wife met Ron on such. Yeah, that's a nice man, right? You just we we I just think about it. We Americans don't think of scientists in terms of being nice. They think they're smart. Come on, you all know that. And mathematicians, you know, they always say, how do you get a personality in math? That's what people ask me all the time, right? I said, because my mom was in English too, <laughs> whatever. But I, I, my point is that somehow we must find ways of showing uh, the ability to connect in our interactions. Uh, and for students, students love going, I mean, English teachers know how to become personal with people in their writing, you know? We in math and science focus on the problem, and that's understandable, but the best will also bring that humanistic approach to it. They get to know the human being. They get to know the human being, and that's the best of scientists and, and of, of any profession. And that's my challenge to us in science and engineering. And yeah. we learn how to explain with clarity when we're really good. The, the line you hear from people so often in STEM is, it's too hard to explain. I would argue that people who are really good can explain a concept to a child at some simple level. You get what I'm saying? To let the child come into it. I'm like, very important. So in, even in answering this question, the ineluctable question is not whether you get the answer. You get the answer, you get a B plus, maybe A minus. But to get a really solid A, the question is, how would you help a 12-year-old solve the problem herself? That's the real question. Because you can intuitively maybe get the answer, but how do you go about pulling from others something that helps them know how to solve the problem? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Freeman, so you brought up... Uh, and I didn't mean to insult any scientists in the room. I really did. Right? No, all the scientists are still working on that problem. I can guarantee you. And like, they're too embarrassed right now that they don't know the answer to it. Uh, I've had PhDs in math to argue with me on it, so it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Well, that get you know gets maybe to this point of uh, humility, you know yeah. that we can't uh, get everything right, oh, right? Yeah. And um, you know, on that subject of humility, um, uh, you had an experience. Well, this brings in yeah. your lovely wife, uh, um, Jackie. We've yeah. been married for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, she taught you a lesson in humility. Yeah. Uh, so many. Which one are you talking oh, about? Oh, the right? first one. The first one. First and then, one. The first one, and then we yeah. can move on from there. Yeah, I was, this was a program for gifted freshmen at my beloved Hampton. And, and I, hey, I, I love it. Only I knew you looked special to me. I felt it. I felt it. I felt it. <laughs> and uh, we were in this first calculus class, and, and the professor said, uh, some of you did well, and that was one perfect score. So, of course, I'm this little... Um, uh, cocky 15-year-old. I just know I've got the perfect score. 15 and, years old and, when he went to college. And I'm, so. I'm, I'm ready to get him get my paper. And uh, she's, and they say, and the woman says, um, it was so amazing. Uh, um, 
we'll go with the A's in, uh, in descending order, and we'll come to the perfect paper last. And so we went all the way down, and we got to the lowest A, barely an A, barely an A. I had a 90, and she said, Rabowski. And I'm so immature, I started having tears. I'm thinking I'm the 100, I'm the 90, all right? Uh, and there are like seven people who are better than I am. And I just knew I had blown it away because I had done a really good job. I was just so immature and careless and cocky, all right? Uh, and then she said, uh, Coleman, you can come get your paper. So all the other guys were ready to get up. And at that time, we called men and women boys and girls in college. If you're old enough, you know at that time, college was boys and girls. It really was. And all of a sudden, a girl gets up. And she's not arrogant about it, and she goes up in the most unassuming way, no big deal, and she has a perfect score. And the class is going, wow. And I holler out, I'm going to marry her one day. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but I must tell you, she laughed at me for two years. She really did. She said, you're crazy. Wait a minute. So I tell my students, if they're better than you, just... Be patient. Just be patient and try to marry them when they're smarter than you are. Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you there's a, a, a lovely video made by uh, Hampton College where they yeah. interviewed you. Oh, the two of us just the recently. Two of you. Yeah. It was like a four-minute interview, but I encourage you to watch it because yeah. it's honestly the sweetest thing because they're uh, discussing like what happened when they first met. Yeah. yeah. And um, anyway. She's my best critic. She really is. And we've been, remember I got married when I was finished college at 18 and got married at 19. So I've been married 52 years. Give her a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm sure she's behind. She uh, was the state, Virginia State Geometry. When I got to campus, somebody said, she's the geometry champion. At that time, they had statewide championships in algebra, in geometry, and, and she was the statewide geometry champion. And people go, wow, a girl. It was so funny. <laughs> and here's the key. There was a colored competition and a white competition at those times. Can you imagine geometry being black? It was so funny. It was so silly. But the reason she was so good, her daddy built houses. And to her, the geometry was real. Pythagorean thing was real. She, you know, she'd been doing this since she was a little kid. You know, it made all the difference in the world. It wasn't just pencil and paper. And it's something to be learned, to be said about hands-on experiences in science and math that makes a difference. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll move on to the next section and you know, connections. You've done your and... homework, though. Have you? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> he, you really study, Karen. He was up all night studying. He really was. <laughs> There's so much to learn from your life and work in history, Freeman. So uh it, it's really, um, it's really an absolute pleasure, and I, I can't say express enough what a pleasure it is for me to sure. be talking with sure. with you right now. Sure. Uh, but going back to connections and destiny, um, we talked about the Children's Crusade. Yeah. And it was that same year yeah. that the state of Maryland, yes, um, yes. Uh, uh, legislation authorized the establishment right. of a new university. Yep. Same year, yep. which yep. was University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Yep. Exactly so right. um, almost again, uh, uh, you know, an in, in interesting connection of yeah. where you would be uh, yeah. later. Yeah. But um, we'll get on to that. But um, I want to just share just this quote that you had in this book, because uh, I think it embodies so much of the spirit of um, aspiration and mm. character that you brought to the university. Um, as a campus... We are a community. Yes. We are inclusive. We are unapologetically aspirational. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> we aim high, yeah. and we encourage our students to do yes. so. Yes. We work hard to get there, and we punch above our weight. Yeah. We aim what America wants to be. To be. That's, right. That's right. Why? Because higher education matters for our students yes. and for America. Yes. Absolutely. So I get goosebumps just hearing you say that. The word, if you don't know the word neodyne, and it really comes out of biology, but there's a book called Geeks and Geezers uh, from Harvard Business. Neodyne, they talk about it as this quality of being forever young. And a part of it is having energy and passion and not being cynical. And I'm always wanting to think about how to keep young, youthful by 
by being excited about things, not becoming been there, done that, cynical, right? And I love the fact that the youth of my campus and are always thinking about how we can be better than we thought. I like saying to America, we represent the notion that you don't have to be rich to be the very best. We in this country have a way of, of saying to people, if you're very rich, you go to certain schools and you become the best. And I, I'm very proud of those. But to be a public, young public university and to be able to produce students who can excel anywhere in the world is huge. And I, I, nothing was a better gift to me than to see um, one PhD from Berkeley and one from Yale, both one now independent investigator, the other postdoc, both Abraham and Emmanuel, UMBC alumni here at Janelle. You give them both a round of applause. They're around here somewhere. <laughs> Just so proud, just so proud of them. And then one other comment uh, to talk about the impact of Howard Hughes. Make no mistake that HHMI appointing Mike Summers, who's on the cover of one of those books, an investigator years ago, changed the trajectory of science at UMBC. There's no doubt about that because that said to other young scientists, who were considering us, wow, they were able to produce somebody like this by giving him the support he needed. And it was Pernell Chopin, I'll never forget, right? And through, through Tom and Aaron, it's this amazing story about how one person, one organization can change the culture of a place and set the bar even higher to be able to say, and what I said was, even then, one day I want to believe that some of our Mahas can become HHMI investigators. And so in the last year or so, when Kafri Zarasa became an HHMI investigator, it was another one of those times for me to cry. I want you to know, it was just that. And he just became full professor at Duke, and he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Give Kaf a round of applause. He's coming to speak here. Later. It's really nice. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so aspirational is the idea, yeah, yeah. And Kaf is coming to visit us here at Janelle in the summer, yes. so that will be fantastic. Yes. I mean, let's go back to the very beginning of this journey yes. because it, it, it sounds like when you first got there, you really asked this basic question mm -hmm. of which the answer at that time was not entirely known. Mm -hmm. What strategies can we develop to help minority students, women, and students in general mm -hmm. to do well in mathematics and science and, uh, and in increase their presence in the faculty? Mm -hmm. And even at that time, the um, black students were, weren't doing well. Mm -hmm. and, a lot of the white students, well, a lot of the white students were right. doing well either. So mm -hmm. this was kind of the key question that you uh, grappled with. Yes. It sounds like, and sure. you also said that you then had the perhaps the most uh, important encounter of your career mm -hmm. early while you were grappling with that question. Right. right. So, and, and you'll have to remind me which of those encounters. I always say something is important depending on the audience. So let's just. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, kind of, kind of. <laughs> but let, let me, before you go any further, I, just with that, um, you may not know it, but I mean, you know that Virginia is the South, Maryland is the South. Birmingham, Alabama would be the deep South. Virginia is the South. Maryland is what we call the upper South. Baltimore thinks like Philadelphia one day and Richmond the next, okay? All right. And I say that because UMBC was the first university in our state founded at such a time that students of all races could go there. Every other university was founded either for blacks or for whites. College Park or Maryland State Teachers College, which became UMES, for example, right? Towson or Bowie. You know? And so we had some blacks there from the beginning in 1966, which was really amazing. The charter in 63, but 1966 was my first year in college and the first year of freshman at UMBC. So I always said it was meant to be somehow. And our new president who comes from the deanship at Duke, a polymer chemist, Valerie Shears Asprey, so proud of her, was born in 1966. So it was all meant to be, if you get what I'm saying, right? That was this, 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 this connections. But the fact is that the attitude at at UMBC was, yeah, it's a really good place because most students flunk out in science. And that, that is a part of the culture of science, that if it's really good, most people can't make it. Think about it. 
most people can't. When I'm teaching new presidents at Harvard from public and private, they will say, how do we get people to stop thinking that, well, if it's really good, most people can't do science? That is the mindset. And when I chaired the National Academies Committee, I'll tell you just one statistic that most people don't know. The higher the SATs, and I wrote math questions for the SATs for years, um, the more prestigious the university somebody attends, the greater the probability the student who begins in science will leave it within the first two years. Did you get that? Everybody says it's all about K through 12 and the fact that uh, they're at certain kinds of schools. No, the more prestigious the university and the higher the test scores and all the kids with the fives on the AP this and that and they go and they start at a higher level. That's one of the challenges. They'll start with another level. And what you don't know is the AP exams, and I wrote math AP questions for years, they're formulaic. So just because you got a five on AP exam doesn't mean you're ready for Cal 3. And if you start in Cal 3, when um, students in that class who even took the class before, and you're used to having problems just like the ones the teacher put on the board, then you're getting you ready for the AP, and all of a sudden you get five problems, two you've not seen before, you get a D, and you get wiped out. It happens all the time. Okay. And that's why we have a smaller percentage. So my point is that somehow we assume that when we have the best students with the high test scores and they go to the most prestigious places, they're fine in science. No, they change their majors. They change their majors, but nobody wants to talk about it. I said that at NIH, and at that time, the general counsel said, you just told my story at perfect SAT, never made a B, went to the most prestigious of all. I started off, and I got a lower than I wanted uh, in, in chemistry. And I got an A in English, and I became an English major and a great lawyer. And it happens. Uh, uh, one of my very dear friends, who's a Shakespeare scholar, she said, I started off in double E, and I ended up in single E. <laughs> Did you get that? It happens. And the people think, well, I wasn't good enough, right? It's more, and as I say in my TED talk, it has to be with, do with the culture of science and science education. And, and the expectations. Those are the kinds of So we needed to change the culture of UMBC to stop being proud when most people were not making it. Because while black kids were saying we were racist because almost nobody was making it in science, the majority of white students weren't making it. We were still producing kids in science because the base was so large. But it was only 25, 30%. And using analytics, we could look and see most are making it, even students who had done well. They were making C's, and when we had the focus groups, my, my colleagues in chemistry, and it was wonderful that uh, Mike Summers was coming in that time, and somebody else who would become chair of the department from Hopkins, who said this to me. She said, I wanted to come here because it's hard to get into med school, but once you get in, you, you're going to make it. Even if you don't do well, they'll give you one more year. But it's easy to get into science. Why is it so hard to graduate successfully in science? That was the question. And for us, it was, well, if it's not just about a minority issue, and for us, it was heavily black, <clears throat> what is, what's the issue? And we needed, as I say in my, in my TED talk, we needed to think about what should be the expectations of us. And I, I'll ask you one question. If I put a problem on the board in differential equations, and everybody says, wow, that was really well presented. And then I give all of you a test on that problem, and no one passes. Did I teach the concept? Our, our, our way of doing things, when I was in grad school in Illinois, um, I rarely saw the face of a professor in there. You only saw the back. From one end, it was all proofs, from one end to the next. And you all were just writing the whole time, right? That was it. And when I, coming from liberal arts college, would say, um, I see how you got to step three, but how did you get to step eight? And in, every, in the first two classes, when I was young, I'm young. I'm barely, I'm really young. Um, and they're all mid to late 20s, all white guys, no women. Of course, no faculty of color. Only one woman of, on the faculty, and she was not tenure track out of 100 faculty, all right? And I'm asking this question, how did you go from step three to step eight? I can get to step five. And in each case, the person would go, isn't it obvious? And I so wanted to say, sucker, if it was obvious, I wouldn't ask you that question. <laughs> but of course, a lowly grad student couldn't ask that question, right? And I would yeah. say, I'm sorry, but it's just not obvious to me. And they would say, well, just come to my office. So I just bugged them a lot, 
right? I did. Yeah. And that was the difference. Well, a few follow-ups to that. First of all, you, you know, I think this culture of asking questions, yeah. which I, I, I know yeah. you, you really uh, instigated uh, yeah. at UMBC in general, yeah. but also with the students, it shows up here in this auditorium. I love it. Because uh, Leslie has now uh, invited the um, uh, Meyerhoff students oh. to HHMI investigator meetings, and they are sitting in this front row here. I love it. I love it. And they are asking the best yeah. questions. Oh, I love it. I love it. And uh, love it. It's, it's just so obvious that they were part of a, a culture yeah, yeah, yeah. where questions are welcomed. I and, love it. And yeah, so it's just fantastic to uh, see the, it. The, you know, and the replicated programs uh, that I was using in Boston, I want to say I was at Duke giving a talk, and there were people from Chapel Hill, and um, there was a group of students on one side and another group on another. And I kept thinking that. One group, they were talking, but they were not being disrespectful. I was giving the talk, but they were clearly thinking about what I was saying and discussing it. And I said, there's something different about that group, and it seemed so familiar. And it turned out they were the chancellor scholars from Chapel Hill. Uh, the, the students from Duke were very individualistic, nice, but just by themselves. And at one point, I said, um, you know, this is one way in which Chapel Hill is way ahead of Duke. Oh, my God. When I said that, because there's that competition between Duke and Chapel Hill, if you can imagine. I'm saying, you all need to learn from UNC okay. how to use HHMI. It was <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about a competition between UMBC and Duke. <laughs> well, uh, I was, and you all, well, it was I, UMBC I and, and, and UVA. Who's from UVA? Ooh, ooh. Oh, that was our moment of glory. It really was. <laughs> but I, I, I want to get to a story that no one's going to read about in any of okay, these books because okay. I know about it from Mike Summers. Oh, okay. And that's, uh, you know, you're a, a young professor. The Meyerhoff program yeah. is just starting. Oh, yeah. okay. And there, there's uh, some twins oh, who yeah. are oh, super yeah. talented, yeah. like high school students. Yeah. Yeah. They turn down UMBC and, uh, you know, they're going to, Duke right. and they sign their housing forms. They're all there, and uh, you, well, you got in a car and turned it around. The uh, the uh, the parent really wanted them to come to UMBC was the question. But the the key that we what we use in those early days when people always thought but of you prestige, drove. I just want to point out they, to everyone not to do, but I did write. I did get to that house. I mean, but they, you, I, as president. The, you know, and that was parents like trying to get me to help them to convince. You know, how kids would do what they want to do, <laughs> right? And the, and the mama really wanted them to have more support. Can you help me? Okay, right? And so, yeah, yeah, and I did do some driving. I really did. But but um, this is the part that you really will like, and that is that um, when you can point to people who've been successful when you talk, and you can say, "Look at this student. Talk to them." So normally, what we will do is have students who've gone on through Meyerhoff at all kinds of places and say, they're there now, ask them what they think. I mean, grad school, undergrad. And often they'll say, this is a great place for grad school. But if you want to be ignored, this was years ago, they're better now, then you come here for $65,000. It's just real. And yeah. I, now I've said that at places, quite frankly. And if you look at the data, the unfortunate thing is that most students of color at most institutions don't end up completing in science. And if they do, my God, kids who went to certain places in engineering and science, they said when they graduated, I don't ever want to see it again in life. I'm going to law school. I'm getting an MBA. So even if you make it and you didn't have the kind of experience that says, this is what I want for life, is it really success? That's the issue. So no, I have done things. You're right, that was a competition. And I did tell Duke Broadhead about that story, <laughs> President Duke, my dear friend. But I, I, I just I love don't that example right. because it's like, you know, <laughs> you know, it just shows like the personal attention yeah, yeah, yeah. that is required sure, to sure. be successful. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, but I do say this to parents. Don't allow prestige to be the only reason you're excited about your son or daughter going somewhere. You want to look at institutions. You want to look at performance of students from a background similar to your child in a particular discipline. You want to talk to students there to say, what's your experience? How are you feeling about it? What's their sense of self? I go to some campuses, and I've told presidents this, and students, sometimes women, sometimes people of color, may be doing okay, but they, they just don't feel. They don't, they're not made to feel like they're special there. You know, a place that I like, for example, is Bryn Mawr. I was 
there recently. I just reviewed uh, the president of Harvard's new book. Uh, Drew Faust is former president. He has a new book coming out called Good Trouble, named uh, Necessary Trouble, named after the John Lewis idea of good trouble, and because she was really a rebel uh, and had gone down to Alabama when she was in high school. And, and she's from Virginia. But what's interesting is that Bryn Mawr has a saying there about women. They said, it took Bryn Mawr to produce the first woman president of Harvard. Is that not a nice statement? You, you get my point? Give, give Bryn Mawr a round of applause for that. It's a very nice statement. And the point is that some places can make certain groups feel very special. And you want the academics yeah. and that sense of self. So I don't want to talk about Bryn Mawr because I want to talk about what UMBC yes, yes, does yes, to give yes. that sense of self. I appreciate that. I appreciate um, that. And, uh, you know, so maybe you could yes. talk about the key ingredients. Sure. We don't know that much. We're going to run a little bit over. I hope that's okay, okay. for everyone. Um, and it's, and this, this sense of self, and it's about students of all races. You don't know this. What percent of my students, undergrad, do you think have a parent from another country? Take a guess. What did I hear? 50? 40? 10, it's 60%. And this is right outside of Baltimore at the BWA airport. 60% of my undergraduates, all races, we're about not quite 20% black. The largest minority group is Asian. We're close to 30%, um, uh, high 20s. But, and we are maybe 7 or 8% Latino. So we are 40-some percent minority. I mean, 40-some percent white and 6% minorities, but it's Asian heavily. But the point is, 60%, whether their parents are from Russia or from India or from South Korea, wherever. Um, and I tell you that because there is an intensity that you get when you get more in international influence. We feel like the Plaza of Nations at the UN when you're walking around. And I love that. It makes my kids from the eastern shore of Maryland or from Prince George's County see how hard people work from all over the world. And we know that we are so good in science in this country because of people who come from all over the world to study and contribute. Give people from around the world who are here a round of applause, would you? It's very important. It's the strength of science. It really is. Now, with that said, so think, and then the, the professoriate is the same way. You've got so many from all over the world. Here's the point. Um, we have this belief that we need to build community, that everybody needs to be a part of some community, that we don't want just people by themselves. And that we start, Meyerhoff started it, it was so that we started all kinds of communities of people in the humanities, in the arts, and everything, where people are a part of some community to, to understand they belong, to have people they can talk to when they're discouraged, and to know it can be hard. Now, here's the challenge in science. If I'm in science, if I'm in biochemistry and my friend is in a social science, my friend may be able to go out on the weekends and have a good time and wait till the last minute to write a paper. And if, if my friend is good, may get a B or an A. But I always said, you have to marry science. You can't not be in class for a week and expect to do well. So we have to have that as a part of the culture. And that's not, and, and the humanities are important, the arts, but the nature of the work. It's such, you can't just take the notes and think you're going to be okay. You've got to be there to have the experience. <clears throat> so that's a part of our culture. And about 60% of our students are in science and engineering. And what's nice about that <clears throat> is that people talk to science. We want them to learn how to talk to science. Just as we have lots of, I'm studying French. Keep off français. Keep off français, you see. Who speaks French, right? So je parle français. And when I started, my students said I was too old. That was all I needed to hear, that I was too old, right? And we have this myth, if you get older, you can't learn. That's, that's crazy. So je parle français avec mes étudiants tous les jours. Mon professeur est un originaire de Normandie. Il est très difficile, mais, mais il est très bon, très bon. So I'm studying French all the time. So when I'm walking across campus, somebody is correcting mon pronunciation all the time, all right? And I'm studying Simone Beauvoir and Victor Hugo. And, and so I want people to see me learning all the time. I want me to, people to see me in labs asking questions all the time. So to be a place where everybody asks questions, not just in your discipline, but just the intellectual curiosity, allows students to feel good about having to respond. On the elevator, tell me about your research. You assume everybody's doing research, whether they're in the history of World War II or in a class on HIV. Right? So, and so, I mean, to create that environment where it's really cool I used to say to be smart. I don't even use that term anymore, um, following the social scientists. 
Because if you have the smart class and then you got everybody else, what are you telling everybody else? You see what I'm saying? We need to be able to. So mile hauls, we say you may not start off being a mile hauler, but if you work hard, you can become a mile hauler. It's the hard work and working with others that can make the difference. But I would say it's really cool to be intellectually engaged. It's cooler on my campus to have a paper published or to be a part of one of the, what we call the intellectual sports, like um, chess, cyber hacking, for example, or mock trial than it is to be in an athletic endeavor. So when you see the chess players, you bow in reference. Because <laughs> you know the Russians consider chess a real sport, right? You know, and my, my point is, it's the culture yeah. that matters. Unfortunately, and we like being nerdy. Did you get that? I am the mega nerd. Did you get that? Yeah, math goosebumps. I am the mega you know, I am that. And I'm saying, for most kids in high school, the coolest people are the athletes. And I'm okay to be that. It's great when you're a scholar athlete. An athlete, but I'm just saying, if we want more students in science, we have to find ways of wanting them to be unapolog- unapologetically aspirational, to want to do science, to want to ask good questions, to want to love math. You know, that's, and so bringing a lot of kids to campus and letting them see athletes who also enjoy working in a lab, that's what's cool. That's that. So speaking of asking questions, uh, I have this desire to ask you about 20 more questions. Uh, and we didn't get to the uh, national uh, stage. But yes. maybe we could consider this, Freeman, as part one of a dialogue. <laughs> and what does the community think about bringing Freeman back for part two? Huh? That's nice. Sure, I would come back. I told Aaron I, I really belong to HHMI, so I, <laughs> I mean, y'all may be immortal with the, the scholars, right? <laughs> but keep remembering, though, when you got your name or something, it's like you're kind of dead. So I've got to come so I can show you I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> no, but I'm serious about <laughs> sure, that. Sure, I, I know. Think, I, would, uh, I really would. Uh, yeah. We would love to um, engage in part two. Sure, sure. Sure, um, yeah. But, you know, it's... You know, we don't have very much time, and I know it's going to take a while f- for everyone out there to solve that math problem. Yeah. And the drinks may run out eventually. <laughs> but um, maybe we could just take a few sure. questions. I know we've gone on. Uh, I, I will give you over. one statement to think about. I think that scientists have a responsibility, all of us, educated people in general, but especially scientists, to think about the language we can use to get so many Americans just to open their minds to the power of, of data, of the truth, of scientific reasoning, of how we use that reasoning to solve problems and to help humankind. You may not know this, but only a third of Americans are in families where someone has graduated from college. When I say that to people, they say, oh, that couldn't be true. Most people I know have a college degree. Well, people are around people who have the same level of education so often. So doctors around doctors, scientists, but plumbers make a good living. You, you, you get my point? There's nothing wrong with being a plumber. I'm just saying, though, but it's the people who've had the experience of being around this education environment that really appreciate the value of science. But most people don't, just as they think. When I ask the question of American audiences, how many of you love math, among educated people, they say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence? <laughs> I get that all the time. I mean, so just forget math, but just in science. We, we have to find ways of pulling people into the work. Not because they're going to become scientists, but because we want them to appreciate how critical this work is to the future of humankind. Whether it's about climate change, health care, you know, all of these areas. And we saw that in COVID. And we haven't taken full advantage of saying if it were not for the, not, it's not just medicine, I mean, I mean, science, broad science, if it hadn't been for that, think about the death of so many people. But people don't really know that. And that's our responsibility. That's the, go ahead, go ahead. We'll take a, just maybe a couple questions. Yeah, please. And then we can, um, sure. um, I know there's probably a, okay. uh, about 40 questions yep. out there. Go ahead, but, please. Um, one, thank you so much. One of the most powerful uh, oh, talks you. I've heard. Um, in your story, when I, I hear your grandmother's yeah, story, yeah. Uh, Booker T. Washington, to your yeah, grandmother's, sure. to your 
parents to you. Yes. I see a story that you have. Thank you. And when you have international students coming to UMBC, yes. Yes. I see a story. I'm a child of immigrants, and yes. we have this story. For students who don't have a story or the story is broken yes. because nobody has gone to college yes. or through childhood yes. trauma, yes. what is the key? Is it the culture at UMBC, or what have you seen succeed sure. for those children who sure. don't have that so, continuity? And, and I appreciate the sincerity of your question. Language is so important. I begin by saying every person, every child every, has a story. And I would never call the story broken. I would say the story may have all kinds of curves. We work with first-time offenders, for example, children between the ages of 8 and 17. Each of them has a story. Will they come to UMBC? Very few will have the reading skills, but we can get them into some kind of educational pathway. But here's my point. We need people to know their stories, whatever their stories are, and to know themselves well, well, well enough to know they have the chance to help create the next chapter of their stories. That, that's the point, the next okay. chapter. Now, now, my students who have an international background often do have some advantage. Not all. Many are first-generation college still. But they, you know, I have to tell you, they have that advantage, that intensity. My parents did everything to give me this chance to get to this country. And there's that hunger. You know, my mom is going to kill me if I don't finish. And I love that. Now, I sometimes say those of us in the Deep South have that. You know, I'm from Alabama. That's another country, too. That we had this. <laughs> <laughs> Just halfway kidding. But the fact is, <laughs> but the fact is though, but, but I, I want to say this. It's, it's so important that we help each person appreciate that somebody has worked to help them get to wherever they are. Sometimes it may be, not be the parent because the mom may be on drugs. Dad may be in, but it's a grandmother who worked so hard to help them get to us, right? And one of the things I always say on my campus is if you made it here out of the inner city, you are really good. They may have less academics. They may only have a pre-cal background and others have a, B, and B, C calculus now, I'm saying. But you made it here. You need to know. You've come so far, okay? I know you can keep going. I have students from my hall who, there's a range, people don't know, there's a range even in test scores of my students. I can think of a student who didn't have a high test score. We used a different criterion. Uh, she never missed a day of school, K through 12. Wow. Ever, wow. ever. And I would see her at UMBC and I'm, I'm going to talk medically here, and I would see her when she was sick in the month, right? And I would say, um, why don't you just take the day off? And she said, I can't ever, ever. It was that fire she had. She went on and got an MD, PhD from Hopkins. Wow. It was that fire that she had, all right? You know, and I'm saying, if we can help students have that fire in the belly, even when they don't. When I went, even though I had studied in Massachusetts, when I went to Hampton, the best prepared kids really were those who were from other countries, African and the islands, those who had gone to integrated schools, or my, my wife's school had Latin. We didn't have Latin, you know. <clears throat> and so I was not, I really was not the best prepared. What I learned to do was to get around the best prepared, and I wouldn't let them go. I mean, I just read. <laughs> By the third year, oh, yeah, I was there. Oh, yeah. But I had to spend two years being humble, saying, no, I'm okay. But they were far better prepared than I was. But, but having a story and having somebody know, no, you may not be. You, you're not. I think of a young man who's now a tenured professor in engineering at Clemson who said in the interview at, at Meyerhoff, he said, I'm from Brandywine, Maryland. I did not go to a science and tech school like Roosevelt High School or blah, blah. All the other kids were bragging on going to the big science and tech schools in Montgomery County. He said, he said, all I can tell you is I'm quarterback of the football team. I'm going to be the valedictorian of my little school, and I play the piano in the church. And he said, somehow my faith and my mama will get me through. Somehow, you know. <laughs> and I love that kid. He had the lowest. He had all A's at his little school. His test score was at the bottom. He got the PhD in, in bioengineering. He's now tenured faculty. He had the attitude and the fire in the belly. And he was humble enough to say, I don't get it. I don't understand. I need help. And he never gave up. And that's what you want. You want him to have that fire in the belly. 
and to understand it. You know, when I, sometimes when I go and I'm working at the Ivies and I'm talking to kids of all races, the kids who come from the, from the Andovers and Exeters are so proud that their grandparents went there. And I understand that. That's, you know, they are from old money. But the kids who come from the, the Publix in New York, when they tell me the name of their school, they're embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, I went to a public school. And I always shock them all. I said, raise your hand if you went to a public school. And they do like that. And I said, let me tell you, I said, I'm so proud of you and your, your, your heritage and your granddaddies went here or your, you know. I said, but those of you who went to public schools, you are so impressive. It took so much for you. I mean, I really worked. I wanted them to feel. I mean, you are what America is all about. You know, you did not start on third base. Do you get my point? Yeah. And that's not to put anybody else down, but if you've had a certain background, you're supposed to do. I tell people, I had educated parents, I'm supposed to do so, because I did have a mama who was a math and English. I'm supposed to do that, right? But the kid who didn't have that, and if they can do that, oh, we need to let them know their story is so much more powerful. That's the point. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, so I was thinking about the WIDA courses and people who get themselves out of the sciences. Yes. Um, but one thing I'm serving about that is we haven't taught people how to fail in some ways and yes. become resilient and get back up. Yes. And so I'm wondering, how, how do we teach people how it's to such a great be question. resilient? And, it's such a great up? question. The two things I would say, I said something controversial. That, that was an ASU GSB innovation conference in San Diego a few weeks ago. Part of it I spent with one of Aaron's... Uh, uh, students who's a professor at San Diego, uh, um, a Gentry Patrick, and it was wonderful. But here's the point. I said, they asked me about failure, and I said, you know, there's something about failure that's magical. And people said, what? I said, and I, for my own failures, that you think it's the worst thing in the world when you fail, and yet sometimes as you learn to get knocked down and you get back up, and you all of a sudden are shocked when you're even better, there's something magical about that. There really is. I mean, when you think about innovation, uh, you think about the people, whether not just in starting companies, but in science, that we learn sometimes more from the failure than others. So one of the things we do at my heart that you may not know, we said um, we, in, in, in lower level science, we call anything below a B failure. Because if you get a C in the first year, you're not going to get an A and B in the second year. Because one thing builds on another in science as it does in French as it does in classical piano. If you don't get that foundation at a solid level, it's really hard to do even better at the Lex level, right? So we, we had people crying in those first years because we had them retake the courses. But we said this, you did okay, but you want to be the best. You don't want to just barely make it. You want to be the best. And we had to have crying sessions with some students who were so upset because they kept saying, oh, I'll do better. No, just as they... Freshmen think they will never fail anything because they don't do it in high school. So they may only be doing not so well, but they will say, I'm okay. Most students would just say, I'm okay. They don't want to tell you what they made. Well, the first thing we had to do was change the culture so people talk about not doing well in classes. So in our town hall meetings, we, we have people get up and to make it not judgmental. Talk about first who's doing well and not just your grade, but where have you, what, what class, in which class are you really learning something? Which class are you really intellectually challenged? And if you tell me a professor is good, what does that mean? Is it that they're explaining the concept clearly? Is it that they're looking at you and they talk? When you say they're not good, is it because you don't think they're prepared? Is it because they're not explaining well? Is it because they don't want to ask you a question? How do you define these things? But most important, when you tell me you're learning a lot, what is it that you're learning and what made the difference? Right? And so we have those conversations. And interestingly enough, uh, the most powerful part is where are you not doing well? Having the courage to say, in this organic chem or this analytical chem, I'm, I'm really having a problem. And the first question is, who are you working with? How many of you are working together? And then the next question is, who are the students at the next level, mile hauls? You know, you have, you have M1s through whatever. The first mile hauls were M1s. That was the first group of males. Then we had women the second year. I didn't want them to call themselves M1s. Why? Because that's a gun. Right? Uh, but they have the last word. I said, why don't you call yourselves my house scholars ones, MS ones? They said, that's a disease. We'd rather be a gun than a disease. <laughs> and they won out. All right? Then we got up to M16s. Oh, my God. There we are again. Right? Well, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, uh, I think Abraham, is, he was in Kizzy's class, if he's in the room somewhere. The, uh, I think he, and he was, uh, he was an M16. 
All right. We now we we're now at the M34s. So every group helps the group. So the question we ask is, so who are the students, the one year ahead of you in chemistry, who got A's in the course? Just to see how resourceful they are. Have you gotten to the people who know more? So my point is, it's about knowing you're not doing well. Have you had the, the entrepreneurial spirit to get to people who can help you, right? And when you got that failure, have you shared it with other people? Not just the grade. The question is, what concepts didn't you understand? Right. The one thing in innovation that I've seen colleagues at UMBC do in some courses that I really like is that when students haven't done quite as well now in chemistry and they get a high C, uh, that they sometimes will have supplemental work in the in the midterm. I mean, between December and February to identify concepts, not explain and to give people chances to do that part of the course over rather than having to take the whole course over, you know, and then have a test because the goal is at the end of the situation, have you grasped the concepts at a certain level of mastery? That should be the point. Old fashioned way of saying, oh, it's not fair to other students to do that. That's silly. You just want students to come up to a certain level of mastery. That's the point. You know? So having that innovation can help when thinking about failure. Yeah. So I saw I, a teacher I right have, there. I said, didn't I? Did somebody have a hand I, on? Didn't I see? You? OK, all right. Okay. I have one announcement. Yeah. Um, um, then we'll close the evening okay. and move to the reception. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want Janili ambassadors to stand up. Oh. Um, or maybe they're all outside. But oh, um, right here. they're wearing this lovely Janilia shirt. And they're really here to engage with our friends from, uh, from the community. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so please go up to them, because they, they want to talk to you and explain uh, what Janilia is about and uh, kind of share what we do with you, um, uh, because you're, you're an important uh, part of our bigger community, and we hope you can learn about the science that I you love do it. And for the K through 12 people, I would encourage you to be as connected to this place as possible. It is best in class in the world. And for your teachers and for your kids, um, any kind of connection you can have. I will tell you, our best students work um, everywhere from in Howard Hughes Lab, high school students who come to us have worked in the HHMI lab or in a national, our national NIH lab or whatever in the summer times. That's, that's what's really nice about this region. Students get a chance to, to see if they have good hands. They get a chance in high school. Same thing I should tell you with the intelligence community. Most of them, we are the largest feeder to the NSA. A lot of those kids start working at NSA in the 10th grade in cyber. So a lot of my students are spies. They're watching you. It's really nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> it really, General Nakasani likes that. But I'm saying to the K-12 through 12 people, it's great that you're here because HHMI has this wonderful attitude that it's never too early to start exciting students about science. You know, it's really nice. Really nice. Well, speaking of excitement and speaking of about a fire in your belly. Yeah. <laughs> Freeman, you got a fire in your mm. belly, and uh, you transmitted big waves of that tonight, oh. and we absorbed it and loved it. I love all of you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>